prayer for health issues and for other problems, Lord, that we might not even know about. But we know that you do. And we know that you're able to heal and you're able to comfort those that are so in need. We pray that you'd be with them. And, and Father, we pray that you'd be very real in each of these lives, Father, and do what needs to be done in each circumstance. Father, we thank Thee for this time of giving that we can come together and lift You up in praise and thanksgiving for all that You've done for us. And may we share that, Lord, by returning the gift back to You. And may each gift be used to glorify and magnify the kingdom of God here on this earth. Thank You, Master, for all that You do for us. In Jesus' name we humbly pray. Amen. Let's stand and continue our time of worship. I want to sing a song that was our, a staple of our Cold War celebration this weekend. Talking about how God's not dead, he's surely alive. Let's stand and sing that. Let's put our hands together in worship. Yeah, let love explode and bring the dead to life. Let love explode and bring the dead to life. A love so bold, a love so bold to see a revolution somehow. Sing that again. Let love explode and bring the dead to life. Let love explode and bring dead to life a love so bold a love so bold to bring a revolution somehow now I'm lost now I'm lost in your freedom and this world I'll overcome my God's not dead he's surely alive and he's a lion, God's not dead, he's surely alive, and he's living on the inside, roaring like a lion, he's roaring, he's roaring, he's roaring like a lion, sing let hope arise, let hope arise and make the darkness hide, my faith is dead, I need a resurrection, Somehow, now I'm lost, now I'm lost in your freedom, and this world I'll overcome, my God's not dead, he's surely alive and he's living on the inside, roaring like a lion, God's not dead, he's surely alive and he's living on the inside. Roaring, he's roaring, he's roaring like a lion. He's roaring, sing out. Let heaven 
of revival. Sing that again. Let heaven roar and fire fall. Come shake the ground with the sound of revival. Sing that again. Let heaven roar and fire fall. Come shake the ground with the sound of revival. Sing it again, my God. My God's not dead. He's surely alive and he's living on the inside. Roaring like a lion. God's not dead. He's surely alive. He's living on the inside. Roaring like a lion. God's not dead. He's surely alive and he's living on the inside. Roaring like a lion. God's not dead. He's surely alive and he's living on the inside. Roaring like a lion. He's roaring. He's roaring. He's roaring like a lion. He's roaring. He's roaring. He's roaring like a lion. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. You may be seated. You can imagine 150 kids, well, 125 kids and then another 30 adults under a canopy singing that song and the echo it made all over Nettles Park. I mean, it was incredible to listen to and to see teenagers from really all walks of life and... Uh, one of the biggest blessings is the return of our dear little Muslim buddy, Nafal, uh, who came with 11, count them, 11 questions for me on Wednesday night. Pastor Tony, I've been asking William this stuff, and he said I'm way over his head on some of this stuff, so I've got them all here on my phone. Wait just a second. He started scrolling through them. 11 questions for me to answer uh, for him about the Bible. <laughs> Some pretty good stuff, too. And, and I, he's been coming on Wednesday nights. I want you to know that. Coming on Wednesday nights, he's kind of manipulated a negotiation with his father and mother to get him here on Wednesday nights. And uh, since we're going into a summer break on Wednesday Night Live, he's been after William and others now to say, all right, how am I going to get together with William so I can continue to learn about the Word of God through the summer? That's good stuff. That's good stuff, yeah. And just... We may not reach tens of thousands, but when we reach one, the angels are rejoicing in heaven over the one that was lost but now is found. So uh, I, had, I had kids come to me, uh, and I know that some came to William and just shared, uh, this is the first time I've been here. And this happens every year, and, but it's always exciting when it happens. This is the first time I've been, and I promise you, I will be back. I, it, is, um, it is pretty awesome to watch uh, kids compete. And bellyache over the officiating, which William and I were the head officials, and so we kept catch all the the junk, you know, of bad calls and things like. That. It's good for William because he he loves railing on officials all the time. It's good for him to be on the other side with a whistle in his hand. He said it was an entirely different perspective, but I just uh, God is not dead. He is truly, truly alive and well. And active in this place. I believe that. This morning we're going to talk about how the cross is not just a memorial marker like we talked about last, last week. It's a living memorial. And I want to go to two passages of scripture. We're going to start in Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. 
And verse 20. I want you to note. Very short outline this morning. That doesn't mean I'm going to ramble. means that this is succinct. What I've got to say this morning. If it doesn't hit you between the eyes. Then I've got a bad mark. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When we live the life of the cross, the definition of what life is changes dramatically. Paul will put it this way in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That is the basic definition of what a disciple of Christ is. To live is Christ, to die is gain. So I want to take that verse, go back to Galatians chapter 2, and look at what Paul expands on in his definition of what Philippians 1.21 says. Real simple. A disciple of Christ is one who lives in Christ. Now, what does that mean? The one who lives is Christ. The one who lives in Christ, what does that mean? I want us to examine what Paul says first in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. He says, for to me, to live is Christ. What does that mean? First of all, it means dying. To live in Christ means that I must die. Paul, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. There's only one outcome for crucifixion. Even the Son of God did not survive crucifixion. He died. He died. Now what he did survive was death. Christ survived death. He did not survive the crucifixion. He died. So when we crucify ourselves with Christ, when we encase our lives with that, we die. We must die to ourselves, to our entire being. In fact, what Paul says in Galatians chapter 2 is in verse 19, he says this, I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. What are you living to today? Is it your house, your wealth, your health, your your position, your power? What is it that you live to Today, Paul says, I live to God. Now, it was not always that way. Before the Damascus Road engagement by Christ, Paul lived to something completely different than God. He claimed he was living to God, but he was not. He was living to a culture. He was living to an established set of traditions and rules and and, uh, guidelines that have been given to him by the Jews. Paul was not living to God. He was living to man's standards of life, which were impossible to live up to. So he had to continue to increase his intensity in order to be able to try and satisfy this urge that he had within himself to be as righteous before God as possible. And no matter what he did, whether it was put people in prison, whether it was put people to death, Paul could never satisfy the standard by which he had set himself up to live toward. Until he met Jesus on the Damascus road. Then, then he was able to live towards something that would not only satisfy the standard, but satisfy his soul too. But as part of living, he had to die to himself. You see, living in Christ is not natural. 
It's supernatural. We prove that every day. On Monday of last week, think through your day. Right now you can click off. Some details about the day. There were some things that happened during that day on Monday that I guarantee you were not supernatural. In the way you lived your life, you lived them either despondently, irritatingly, annoyed, aggravated, or just plain old simple. That's the natural way to live life. But when you live life to God, you live it supernaturally. I don't know what your Tuesday was like. I will tell you that like every other event of the nature of Cold Wars, even though I've done it 20 years now, been a part of one for 20 years, I get anxious. Even though Paul says in Philippians, be anxious for nothing. How Peter says, you know, let your, cast your cares upon him for he cares for you. I was anxious. And Wednesday was pretty good. Wednesday was a great day. I don't know. The weather was good. Uh, the numbers were great the whole bit. What was interesting was is the way they came about. It looked like, oh, we'll have another 50, 60. And all of a sudden, it looked like a swarm of fire ants, red ones, and then blue ones. It just exploded on us. It's a great problem to have when you think, hmm, we're going to have enough to eat. It's a great problem to have. And then... To have the weather that we had on Thursday, and I promise you that as good a front as William may have been portraying to all of the kids on Twitter and Facebook and everything else, when he called me, there was no front. What are we going to do about the weather, Dad? <laughs> yeah, just not. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He was not quite so confident when he called me. I will confess to you that I was curious to see what God was up to. Because God had put on my heart all day. God does nothing to thwart his own kingdom efforts. So, we had 118 kids come when, uh, Thursday night. The Cola Wars. The biggest night of the three. Which typically, the last night is not the biggest night. The second night is. But the last night was the biggest night. It was the worst weather. And it was the greatest competition. You know, it was a great night overall. I, I was just thrilled to see what God did. But you have to, when you live toward God, you have died to yourself so that you can allow him to live through you supernaturally. To bring calm when there's a storm. To bring peace when there's turmoil. To bring victory when defeat looks like it's staring you in the face. When there's discouragement, you find hope. When there's brokenheartedness, you find joy. That's living supernaturally. And it's living a life which Paul says, I, the life that I live in the flesh, in this physical shell right now, I live by faith. I had the right answer for, for William. I, I really, I, I, can't, I can't tell you how strong my faith was on Thursday or not. But I told William when the storm was, was raging around the house and we were talking on the phone, I said, just sit still. Let's wait and see how this thing develops, how long it lasts, and we'll go forth. So we got there. The, 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 the worst of the storm had gone. It was still sprinkling when we got there and started to... Uh, set up for, for the games and stuff. And uh, the director of uh, Clemson Recreation Department, Steve Figueroa, came up. He'd already canceled all of his baseball stuff for that night because the impending second wave was coming, quote, unquote. The second wave was coming. It looked worse than the first. I said, well, okay, I appreciate that. You know, we got, we got phones. We got weather, you know, weather gauges and stuff. We're, you know, we're keeping an eye on it. 
In fact, I had KP keeping an eye on weather all night just to make sure that we were aware of anything that might be coming that might be dangerous. And yet we just kept playing. And the games got better. And the weather was perfect. Now, it was a little wet and nasty. And everybody was gross. And, you know, that type of thing. But, but it was just an awesome, awesome time. Now, in man's mind, there's more to come. We need to cancel baseball games. I was actually pretty tickled for it because... Then we had the whole park to ourselves on Thursday night. It was quiet around there Thursday night. And yet we just kept playing, just kept playing, just kept, kept worshiping, kept, kept allowing God to be a part of everything that was going on. It was incredible, incredible to, to allow my heart at that moment, not very good at this, but at that moment, I allow my heart to just put it in God's hands. I can't control the weather. I've been preaching that to global warming and climate change folks for 10, 15, 20 years. We can't control what is in God's hands permanently. What we can control is what God has placed in our hands to live through Him in doing. Trust Him. Trust him and let God do the rest. Now that's living is Christ. Living is Christ. To live in Christ is to live by faith in the Son of God. Not just a great teacher. Not just a, an individual who put everything on the line for something he believed in. But to live by faith in the Son of God with the example that He loved me and gave Himself for me. When I live in Christ, I live in His love. When I live in Christ, I live in the moment of His sacrifice. That's why Paul would say in Philippians that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings because to live in Christ is to live in the totality of His love. Are you living in the totality of the love of God or are you living in our traditions, our culture, what we know? See, when you live in by faith in the love of God, when you live by faith in the sacrifices of God, you're living in the moment of the unknown. I had no idea, nor did anybody else, that when we set the date for Cold Wars back in January, we would be competing with the Edwards Middle School's eighth grade trip to Disney World. Powder Puff Football, which is always on a Friday night, on Tuesday night. So all the high school girls and a bunch of the high school guys were either late or non-existent for most of Tuesday night. Nor did I know that we were going to be competing in the middle of the week with two huge graduation parties. We figured when we did Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, this is brilliant. Because we won't be fighting any of the things that we've ever fought before on the weekends. <laughs> You know what didn't happen last Friday night? There were no graduation parties last Friday night. Can you believe that? Not one in this area. Now God is God is good all the time. He really is. And he knew in January when we said that, hey, I've got, guys, folks, I've got something better in store for you than you can even imagine. I'm going to do things that you can't imagine. We're out of t-shirts. We're out of food. A few sodas. A few bananas. A few apples. That's about it. God did more than we could imagine or think. He did exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. Because there was a group of folks starting with William and working his way on down, that were willing to say, I will live by faith in the Son of God. 
I will live in his love. I will live in his sacrifice. I will allow him to accomplish his work through me. That's living. Now, I bet you thought I'd finished all I was going to say about dying, but I want, I want you to hear what I've got to say about dying. Here's what it says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 again. For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. How many of you consider death a good step forward in your life? Yeah, yeah. Maybe one or two. When, you st when you're really honest, I I'm, not, I'm not looking forward to death, not yet. That's not exactly, you know, even Jesus didn't look forward to death. In fact, he tried to plead with the Father. You know, there's another way. This death thing is not something that makes me comfortable. Death is not something that makes us comfortable. But Paul says it is a reward. It is something that brings a positive outcome to our lives. When we live in Christ, death is a good thing. Understand this. The reward, eternal life. But it's more than just eternal life. When my dad passed away, when we got the news almost nine years ago now, nine years ago this fall, that, that dad's cancer was terminal, my dad and I had a conversation. I said, Pop, this is what the love of Christ is ultimately for in our lives, to give us a security, a safety, that we're okay, that in spite of ourselves, we have been forgiven of our sins. And when we do die, we have the hope of eternal life. I watched my dad die with a greater faith than I've ever watched anybody die with before. He trusted God for every breath from that moment on. It was incredible to watch. But dying is more than just eternal life. Dying is about the abundant life here. In John chapter 10 and verse 10, Jesus said this, I have come that they may have life. Do you realize that Jesus came so that we might have life? And we think, oh yeah, that's eternal life. No, no, no. And that they may have it more abundantly. Right now, we are intended by the Son of God to live a life in Him through him, about him, that is more abundant, more fulfilling, more intense, more incredible, more unbelievable than anything any human could ever promise us in this life. That is for us. If you were in my household Friday night, Got home late Friday night trying to help Benjamin and Caroline get settled in their home to be. Lost all my cable, all my internet, all my phones. And I was worried about the pacers. You know, something really important in life. I was worried about my pacers. And they were miserable. They were miserable on that night. Earlier in the day, our beloved Tigers were just as miserable on the baseball field. And so, by texting, William and I are like this. I can't believe how bad they are. They stink. Daddy, you wouldn't believe how pitiful this is. And I said, yes, I will, because I'm listening to it on the radio. It's horrible. It's horrible. We're sitting there just moaning back and forth. It's awful. Over what? A ball. Now, I love ball. You know I love ball. But that's not abundant life. I've won championships. Been a part of championships. Been rooted for teams who have won World Series and Super Bowls and, and national championships and the lot. Guess what? They satisfy you for about a week and a half. Then you start looking to next season. Oh, my goodness, how awful it's going to be, you know? That's not what life abundantly is supposed to be about. You know what life abundantly is?